Alfie Williams is 14. Like many teenagers, he likes gaming, walking his spaniel, Freddy, and larking about on the way to school, where he's a top student. But Alfie has cystic fibrosis, a life-limiting genetic condition that attacks the lungs. So he and his mum have, for an entire year now, since Covid hit, either been isolating at home or he's been recovering from surgery in hospital. That the vaccine trials only just starting on children is bittersweet. I think it's wonderful to know that it is being trialled and that they are looking for definitive answers as to uh, whether it, it will work in children and whether it will stop transmission and prevent illness. Um, but for us, it's already too late. We've spent nearly a year in these four walls, not being able to leave the house and not being able to have any semblance of normal life. Alfie's not been to school since the 10th of March last year. So it's wonderful to know that we're progressing, but Alfie has a life-limiting condition and time is not on his side. If you were offered the vaccine today, there's no question in your mind and Alfie's mind, you, you would take it. Alfie and I have discussed it at length and with all of his clinical team and everybody is of the opinion that on the balance of risks, that this would be a great thing for Alfie to do. And he just needs to get back to normal. He needs to have the life of a child. 300 children between the ages of 6 and 17 have volunteered to take part in what's called phase two trials of the Oxford AstraZeneca jab. It's only for young people with no underlying health conditions. Interim results could be available by summer, with final approval still several months away. I think that's really, you know, exciting. It, it probably won't be imminent but eventually hopefully you know my peers will be able to get it as well and and that'll be really exciting it'll be really good it was good um it felt good to be helping the research and get it rolled out into children to protect us and while the oxford team's confident the vaccine will prove both safe and effective for children for people like alfie approval can't come soon enough there is a subset of children who will benefit from vaccination. So even in the first wave, we saw that the majority of admissions were adults, but there were over 500 children who were admitted. These tended to be children with pre-existing medical conditions, so children with neurological conditions or perhaps already with respiratory conditions. And it may be these children that we target with vaccination first. If the clinically vulnerable were part of this trial, Alfie would be first on the list, says his mum. You're not worried about any potential risks that there might be because we don't know yet do we we don't know how the vaccine will impact young people these vaccines have been given to some of the most vulnerable in society elderly and and ill patients and they're as far as we're led to believe all doing well on it and i just think that alfie deserves that as well we did exactly what the government asked us to do to shield to save lives and protect the nhs and we just want the opportunity to be released from that shielding now and from that protective bubble. We want to go out there and yes, if there's a risk, run that risk. But it, it's got to be preferable than to the life that we're living at the moment. European Union chiefs have written to member states reminding them to work together after a number of countries shut borders as part of their efforts to curb the spread of the virus. Huge tailbacks formed after Germany began restricting travel from the Czech Republic and Austria following concerns over outbreaks of COVID variants. 300 cases of the South African variant were found in the Tyrol region of Austria, but the government there says that shutting the border is half-baked and only causes chaos. EU officials are worried that restricting movement is undermining the single market and risking trade disruption. Well, I'm joined now by Professor Linda Bald, who's Chair of Public Health at the University of Edinburgh. Thanks very much for coming back on the programme, Professor Bald. I mean, listening to those pieces at the top of our programme, you get the impression that the priorities are shifting at a fairly late stage. You know, we're looking at people who should be shielding 1.8 million because of, you know, different reasons and different postcodes. Kids are being, you know, vaccinated. Should some kids be vaccinated before elderly but healthy patients? What do you think is going on here overall? Well, I think we've been learning that all the way through this pandemic about how to respond. And, and you know, the UK has been scrambling and catching up in so many different ways. But just to start with the shielding extension, I mean, I do understand this. 
this is a well-developed risk prediction model. We've seen this type, these types of methods used for other conditions. And, you know, if we look back to the spring, we didn't know the impact of, um, for example, overweight and obesity on the disease. We might have assumed respiratory conditions were a risk, but we didn't know the full spectrum. And, of course, welcome in this risk prediction model, we can also look at the community somebody lives in and how likely they might be to risk, uh, be at risk as a result of that. So... It's probably a bit late to be doing this now, but I think the benefits of shielding guidance are not only slightly higher prioritization for vaccines, bearing in mind that 900,000 people of these within that group have already had their vaccine, but also access to statutory sick pay mm. and better access to medicines, etc. So I think this is welcome, but you're right, things are keep chopping and changing. Because we have known some of the things that you've mentioned for, for quite a long time now, and really since the summer, or even late spring. Do you think that the whole priority list for vaccines should have taken that into account much earlier? I do think so, yes. I think we probably had this knowledge as just in terms of the refinement, it's come slightly too late. I mean, ISERIC, some of the big cohorts that have looked at people who've been admitted to hospital and the risk factors have been pretty clear for some time. I mean, I think there's an ongoing debate now about prioritization for vaccines, not the, the, the groups at the top, but we're going to have now an active public discussion, aren't we? And the JCVI is mm. looking at this now in terms of the younger age groups and prioritization. Will it be key workers first, the police, even people working in supermarkets, teachers, etc.? So I think this is a, an approach that other countries actually have been taking in terms of working age population. And I, we expect to hear much more about that soon. Even with the known unknown of new variants and variants that we might be producing at home here, you know, without letting people in to the country, do you personally, as an expert, see a clear path out of this pandemic now for us? I certainly see a much clearer path than we had some months ago. Um, so the first thing, obviously, everybody's aware that the vaccines are good news, although there's still questions about, for example, do they prevent transmission? And they're not gonna provide 100% prote protection, how long is the protection? But that's really good, and we're doing amazingly well, only behind Israel and the United Arab Emirates and the speed. So that's the best part. And then looking ahead, I think we're making progress in um, reducing the incidence and prevalence of the virus. And we know how to do that now with public health measures. So I think we can see in the next few months, I think these variants, while serious, are being used slightly as a bit of a tool to remind the public they are serious. I, I, I'm not ju judging that. And that, you know, this is a crisis. But Part of the reason we have the variants, Matt, and I'm sure you've had guests on the program who've explained this before, is because we've allowed infection rates to be high, and that gives the virus an additional chance to change. But moving through the next few months, we're going to hear on uh, Monday from the Prime Minister and on Tuesday from the First Minister in yeah. Scotland what is the roadmap. And I expect there to be clear indicators and clear um, signs of a direction of travel. And then final point is there are several things we still have not sorted. Uh, a comprehensive quarantine, better test, trace, mm -hmm. isolate, protect, um, and then support for self-isolation. And those are still gaps in the UK government's response. Well, we'll be watching very closely. Linda Ball, thank you very much indeed. John.